Perfect. Okay. Um, just to tell you all, I don't have any disclosures to make. I don't have any conflicts. Um, okay. So, so why am I here? If I'm not, if I'm not like one of the clear patient populations, um, I'm here to talk about really what did it feel like to be a patient? And I think part of treating TB patients is not just about the drugs um, and keeping them alive, although that is the number one objective. There's also the mental health component of it. How did it feel to be a patient? And I know that compliance with patients is also something that you guys all deal with. And um, I wanna talk about the link between the language that you guys use and some of the stigmas associated with the disease and the mental health aspects and how that actually affected my care and how it changed it. Um, so that, that's what I'm here to talk about today. Um, so like I said, I'm Kristen. I was diagnosed with TB. Uh, luckily, it was a responsive, drug responsive TB, um, but it was an active TB infection and that was in August 2016. Um, I really don't know how I got TB, but my best guess is that I love to travel. At one point, my husband and I took a, almost a year off from work and we traveled all over the world. Um, we are very conscious travelers. We always check the CDC site. I got every vaccine that I needed. We were registered with the State Department for any uh, civil unrest that was happening. So I felt like I was fairly compliant, but we did things like take 36 hour train rides in India um, where we were in, you know, crowded, crowded cars and we would sleep there overnight with people. Um, I'd be on buses in Vietnam overnight, um, overnight buses in Turkey. These are TB hotspots in the world and I visited them all. Um, and while I was careful, I'm guessing I caught it somewhere along the way. What I started to notice was that I had a little bit of pneumonia. If I laughed very suddenly um, or had to cough, I could hear fluid in my lungs, um, and that was a little bit concerning. I actually discovered it because I thought I was taking a nap on the couch and I thought that my cell phone was vibrating on the couch and it was actually my chest. Um, my husband thought I was crazy. He's like, your phone isn't ringing. And I'm like, I keep feeling something. Uh, and that was the beginning of it. And so. I decided to brush it off. My husband said, you need to go in. I finally went in and the doctor said, you look young, you look healthy. Uh, you probably have allergies. Here's some Zyrtec, here's some Flonase, here's some saline. You know, good luck. You're young, you're healthy. I don't know what else to tell you. And so, I mean, these pictures here on the slide, I had TB in, in both of these pictures. There was really nothing to indicate that I would be a carrier. What ended up happening was after the course of eight months and maybe three doctor's visits where it wasn't improving, I started to notice that my sputum was getting yellower and yellower, and then eventually it started to have blood in it. Um, it felt very weird to me, and I was tired of getting sent home with more allergy medications, and so I started taking photos every time I coughed something up. I would run and grab a tissue and take a photo. I have spared you those photos, but I collected them on my iPhone and created an album, uh, booked another doctor's appointment, went in and showed my doctor, look, this is real, there's blood, I'm coughing up blood. Um, this doesn't seem like allergies to me. At that point, she finally paid attention. So now we're at Friday. Um, I think I had gone in Thursday, and Friday morning I got a call from my doctor, and that was already an alarm, a red flag, because I was never getting that kind of response from my doctor. And all of a sudden, she called me back immediately. And she said, I'm sorry, but your sputum test came back positive. You have TB. Um, someone will call you from the San Francisco Department of Public Health. Uh, stay away from people. Now, again, you have to remember I was ignored for eight months. I used the word sputum a little bit earlier, but this was not a word that I was familiar, familiar with at all. I've never heard that word. I actually entitled the album on my phone, Goop. <laughs> um, so this was very weird to be getting this call and to all of a sudden have a bunch of medical jargon um, spewed back at me. You have TB. I'm like, I know I have my vaccination card. I travel, I have TDAP. I didn't know T and TDAP was uh, tetanus. 
it was all very confusing and there was just a lack of explanation. And after being ignored for so long, I didn't take it that seriously. She told me to stay away from people. You need to get away from people. And I was at work at the time and I thought, whatever, like I'm going to finish out the day and figure out what that means. I also mentioned to her that I had a flight to Hawaii the next morning to join my family for a birthday celebration. Uh, and at that point, she got really stern with me and said, this isn't a recommendation. This is very serious. The next phone call I got was from the CDC, um, maybe 30 minutes later, which again, another red flag. How could this be escalating so quickly? Um, she said, your doctor said you have some flights coming up. And I'm like, what is up with this doctor that ignored me? She's fantastic, by the way, and I love her. But... <laughs> She's ignoring me and now she's tattling on me to the CDC. This is insane. Um, if you don't send proof of cancellation, we will put you on the do not board list. As she's talking to me, I'm looking up on my phone what the do not board list is, reserved for chemical warfare terrorists and people with Ebola. What on earth is going on? Um, they scared me sufficiently that I went ahead and canceled my tickets um, immediately and they got back to me and said this should be fine. But there was this massive escalation and panic without a lot of explanation that was happening. Um, and at this point, the CDC and now the public health department had gotten a hold of me and said, basically, it's the weekend. We're closed. So you need to stay home. You need to be quarantined. And um, we'll see you on Monday, Monday morning. You need to come into the clinic and wear a mask and don't get near anyone. Um, I was telling Lana um, and Dr. Horn that this reminds me a lot of what people are going through with COVID right now and not in a good way. Uh, I actually have a little bit of like bad feelings about this where I'm feeling very isolated and stigmatized. And I, I don't have coronavirus, thankfully, but it, it's very reminiscent of it. And if any of you guys are caring for people with COVID, I'm hoping that some of the lessons and things that I'm talking about today might transfer over in how you talk with patients and, and deal with their care, because it is very frightening and isolating. So, uh, like I said, that was on a Friday. Um, public health department was closed. Doctor's offices were closed. And so, like any millennial, I had the internet um, available to me, and so I did a quick Google search. This is literally what came up when I searched tuberculosis. This seems incredibly extreme to me. I don't look like this. I didn't think I was dying. I just had some blood in my sputum. Um, and so it was like fairly alienating, again, without any access to um, direct doctor to patient communication or any sort of um, handbook or anything like that. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about what I was able to find on the CDC website about TB suspects and how to interview them, which was also frightening. But this is basically what was available to me online. A lot of medical jargon, a lot of really scary images. Um, and so I'm now isolated. I'm the only one in this situation, and I have no information to tell my friends and family, but everything I read online is horrifyingly scary and and I knew I had touched friends babies and held them I knew I had been in long car rides with the people who had mattered most to me I had a mother-in-law who was undergoing chemo at the time and I had spent a lot of time with her again no guidance or anything like that and and it felt very unnerving um I also felt, because when I was looking online about the CDC, the reference to people with TB at, in an early stage is usually a TB suspect, um, examination of TB suspect, treatment of TB suspect. And I would say that that's probably the most stigmatizing language that I had seen online. Um, and I know it's a very common term that people in the healthcare industry use, but it made me feel like I had done something wrong. I was a criminal in hiding. I, uh, and again, without somebody to talk it through with me, I didn't know how to then transfer that information and communicate it to those people that I might have harmed or, or gotten sick. So my, Monday finally comes around. Um, you can see I'm still there trying to work on my phone. Again, not a ton of information. I had my husband there with me. Uh, and again, the way that I dealed 
I dealt with it was that I started taking pictures and started Snapchatting my experience to friends because I had no other way to talk to them. Uh, I wanted them to know that I was figuring things out just as they were. And they were very curious. What did this mean for them? Why couldn't they see me? Did I get them sick? Uh, and so I would send these out. I'd also say that there in that middle picture while I was about to get the x-ray, um, one of the x-ray technicians was talking to his buddy coming down the hall and was saying, oh man, like this one, next one's got TB and he was acting really scared, like he didn't want to do it. And I'm like, really? Like, I don't understand. Stay, I still, I don't get it. Why am I such a pariah all of a sudden? This is insane. Um, and then quickly, this turned into my new life. I got this little sheet that said, you're taking these drugs that I don't know how to pronounce. Um, I do now, but didn't then. Uh, the numbers seem really large. <laughs> If I ever had a prescription for anything before, it was like 20 milligrams, 10 milligrams. This seemed, again, crazy. Um, I wasn't very sick. I, again, had blood and a cough, but I was an active, you know, young adult. And so taking these pills actually made me feel a lot worse than I ever did before I was treated with TB. I had a head-to-toe um, just allergic reaction. So they actually, in a moment of irony, re-prescribed me some Zyrtec to try to quell the allergic reaction. Um, but basically my stomach for the next nine months was completely destroyed. Um, I was dealing with the allergic reaction to it uh, and felt a lot worse than I ever did before I had TB. Um, so again, some of my Snapchats, uh, I would be taking liver tests fairly regularly. So there, my liver's hanging in there. Uh, this was also a, a bit of a shock. As information started to come out while I was being treated, um, and I would say that nobody gave me a full picture of what the nine months was going to look like. It was little by little, and I sort of understand it. I understand that it's a lot to take in at once. Um, you can scare people. But it felt like shock after shock after shock. So first it's like, stay away from people. You're going to have to take these medications. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. All allergic reaction is sometimes a response to that. Oh, by the way, we need you to come in for a liver test because this could really adversely affect your liver. And I'm like, did anybody give me that choice? Nobody read me the side effects of these medications ahead of time. Do I have a choice? Can I decline it? I found out over a year later when I finally went to my ophthalmologist uh, to renew my glasses, I said in passing, sorry, it's been so long, I had TB. And she said, oh, did you take this drug? And I said, yeah. And she said, oh, that could, uh, that could actually really affect your eyesight. We should check that. And I'm like, nobody said that to me. That's insane. Um, so there was just this constant uh, progression of discovery and not everything was... Um, a delightful discovery. It was oftentimes things that I wish I had known before, or wish I had some, some sort of control of. Okay, then came the hardest part for me, and that was the friends and family part. I had talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, I had Googled and found everything I could about tuberculosis and saw the CDC handbook on examining TB suspects and their family and friends. So I knew exactly what they were going to ask me. I knew exactly what I was going to um, have to answer. And I, I wanted to be very forthcoming, but I was also really nervous about what the results were going to be. I mean, these people are the people who matter most to me in life. You can see there's a baby in one of those pictures. Um, these are my in-laws, my coworkers, my parents my best friends, and nobody gave me a handbook of how to communicate to other people what it was that I was going through or what I might have done to them. That I had to figure out on my own, and it was trial and error. Sometimes I would deliver the message, and I was like, that was great. I don't think I scared them. I think they understand. I think they feel bad for me, but they're taking it in stride, and sometimes I would bluster through it and they would end up feeling angry at me and I 
felt like I had let them down and they were really nervous and scared and they just wanted to get off the phone and go take a test. And I mean, this is a lot of people to do this with one by one. The other thing was, and I know this is small, I apologize, but if you guys can see this, I was working at Google at the time and Google has a very diverse population of employees. They've dealt with diseases before, but I would say that they didn't handle this one that well. So I let the company know that I had TB um, and they immediately sent out within 24 hours this company-wide email. Um, it was actually a subsidiary for Google that I was working for, Nest. Uh, they make the thermostats and drop cams. And so that's why you see as a precaution, I'm writing to inform you that a nester has been diagnosed with TB. And then they wrote in stuff that wasn't that helpful. The facilities team has completed an extra cleaning of Miranda. That was our campus at the time. Now people felt like they didn't want to go to work anymore because there's TB on the surface of everything that I touched and they don't know where it is. And that's not how TB is spread. Uh, so there was misinformation and a fear now of everybody at the company that I worked with to go into work and it caused more panic than any good that it could have created. Um, and so this was really tough to get as well because now my coworkers who know that I have TB are showing me this email um, and asking me like, hey, you touched this of mine, my computer, do I need to get a new computer, those types of things. And, and it was hard to be the one coming from me to try to say like, no, trust me, because if you're the one with the disease, of course, you're going to try to minimize it. And so there was this sort of lack of trust and just misinformation that was going around. Again, here's just some of my, how I dealt with the daily TV grind. Um, you can see me there working from home with my cat, bored. I, I assume that this is what a lot of people are going with right now during um, shelter in place with coronavirus. It's what I'm dealing with right now, working from home. It brings back a lot of these feelings. Um, and I, I will admit this to you guys, um, that in my deepest, darkest thoughts, I think, if I came down with the flu, there's no way I would want to get tested and admit that I have coronavirus because I know what that felt like. Um, and then, you know, the rational part of me is like, of course, I need to report it. That would be so irresponsible. But having gone through this really traumatic experience, it makes me think twice. And it really creates this feeling of empathy for those people who are going through it right now. And so grateful that there are celebrity spokespeople who have gotten coronavirus and are talking about it because that wasn't the case with TB. Nobody, no, there was no, there was no example. There was no community feeling around it. It was just me by myself. So here's another thing that I, I don't think that nurses and, and doctors and healthcare providers really prepared me for. The ups and downs were really tough. I needed to get three negative sputum tests in a row. And I would get one, and then the next one would come po positive, and then I'd get two negatives, and then I'd get another positive. And this went on for about eight weeks, and that was really frustrating. Um, and I think that you, your reaction as healthcare workers or you want to celebrate a positive, but there was no expectation setting, and so the ups and the downs felt very whiplashy to me throughout this whole thing. Um, and again, I, all I had was Snapchat. <laughs> so my friends were along with me on the ride in this roller coaster. Uh, I also tried to maintain a, a sense of humor. I, I called my uh, Kimberly Clark mask the, the best accessory of summer 2016. Um, my favorite snap of the entire thing was TV or not TV, that is the question. And then I would say that Again, I was going through this alone and I was finding ways to be creative about how to have an outlet. Um, and this is one of the things that I think my healthcare providers did the best at. They always engaged in dialogue. Even when I had crazy ideas uh, and the answer was no, I always felt like they listened to me. Can I go scuba diving? Isn't that pretty solitary? <laughs> They would have to sit and they would think about it and they'd say, well, you'd have to get on a boat, but it would be outside. And we would talk through it and it would be a thought exercise. Um, some of the things I was able to do, camping, I was able to play tennis. 
I couldn't get my nails done. It's hilarious to me to see the COVID memes now because I lived them all back in 2016. <laughs> Okay, eight weeks. Eight weeks is what I was in quarantine for, and then I was free. Um, that was a wonderful feeling, and the team did celebrate with me, and that was great. It, we had to do it fairly discreetly because there were other people around who were still in the midst of their TB treatment, but it was really nice that they really took the time to sit and celebrate with me and congratulate me um, for getting through that really tough part of treatment. Um, of course, again, as I was having a progression of information being dropped on me all the time, it's like, you're done, but you're not even close to being done. My quarantine was eight weeks. My treatment was nine months. So I had really the, the long tail end of it still to go. Um, but I was down from six pills to nine pills. Um, and I was able to partake in a a beta test through University of San Diego where they did uh, video daily observed therapy. So I had VDOT, which was just amazing for my freedom. It meant that I could travel again, and it meant that they trusted me, um, and I was incredibly compliant with it. I loved it. I would, I would be creative about how I did my videos, um, and they in turn loved it because they were watching a bunch of dry TV videos, and mine, you know, had views of wherever I was traveling at the time or whatever adventure I was on. And so that was a sort of a fun creative outlet, but also allowed me to be completely compliant with my treatment. Um, again, a little more bumps on the road. Nothing was really completely smooth with my treatment. So um, they cut funding at one point, which meant I had to be uh, tethered again to this daily observed therapy, which was tough. I'm very independent. I, like I said, I like to travel, um, but now it meant I needed to be home every day. It also was tough with work because I was driving into work and the the hours that they were operating were not really conducive to me getting to work on time. Uh, I had to, again, I, after taking some x-rays, there was still spots on my lungs, unidentified spots, and so I had to take this, um, it wasn't an MRI, a CAT scan, and I had a, I have something still on my lungs that we don't know. Uh, it's nice that I have a baseline now, but we had to keep track of this spot, make sure it wasn't growing, make sure it's just some other random tumor or calcified spot or scar tissue, not sure. But that was really tough to feel like I wanted a clean end to all of this. And instead I got, well, now we've got a really good baseline. It doesn't look like this is TB anymore. Go live your life and try not to worry about it. <laughs> that wasn't like super satisfying. Um, but then here we are exactly eight months to the day after I was diagnosed, I got the okay uh, to be done with this, which was such an amazing feeling. Um, and again, I'm still not done because I go back, I think my last final appointment was maybe two years after with a final, a final x-ray um, of my chest to make sure nothing was growing in my lungs. But it sort of like kept dragging on. Again, I never got that complete picture. Even now, it's hard to compile what the full treatment was because it was so, oh, and one more thing, and one more thing, and one more thing. The last thing I want to talk about, which I've sort of mentioned here and there along the way, is that I think at the end, I felt very healthy physically. Um, and it's not only until year, like years later at this point that I've realized what the mental toll was for having TV. Um, people, in doing talks like this, people had asked me about it and it's brought up a lot of feelings that I had um, of isolation. And, and this is really the biggest gap in treatment that I felt from healthcare workers was, how are you doing mentally? How is your mental state? And that wasn't something that they were very keyed into because I was so compliant, um, because I was very attentive to what I was doing because I always was coming in with more information than they were willing to give. Like, I read this on the internet, when is this gonna happen? So they, they felt like I was very engaged and they didn't feel like I was a flight risk or anything like that. So they didn't check on me mentally. Nobody ever asked, you know, how are you dealing with, you know, talking to your friends and family every day? How are you, 
How are you handling the isolation? And this is something that we're doing a great job with on COVID. There's so much support for everybody, but for TB um, patients, nobody was worrying, nobody was giving me tips and tricks for working from home or managing the isolation. Uh, nobody was, was coming up with creative ways for me to have an outlet. Um, that was something that I was doing on my on my own, and and I don't think I did it well. I I, I remember hearing um, at one point, I think it was my third sputum, negative sputum test in a row, and I just cried. It was the first time I had cried during the whole thing, and it was just these moments of just release where I didn't realize I was holding it in, and I was having a sense of humor and being lighthearted hearted about it. But then it would hit me like that was really hard. That was so hard. When I came back from work, uh, my coworkers, in an attempt to be lighthearted because I had been lighthearted about it, had uh, covered my desk in biohazard tape. Um, and that was like a punch to the gut. I thought it would be fine, but it, it wasn't that easy to see that. Um, and again, like you brush it off, but I think about it now, I was scrolling through my pictures and found that and I was like, man, that sucked. Um, and then now it's just all of this flood of feelings that's coming back. Like I said, you know, questioning would I want to admit that I have COVID-19? Would I hide it? Would I be responsible? Or would I just take care of myself? Because it's tough. The mental health aspect of having TB is really tough. Um, and the last thing I want to just say is thank you for all the health workers who are doing this because Really, I wanted to highlight gaps, but your care was so amazing throughout this entire thing. Uh, you guys were, I cannot believe the amount of time it takes to, to treat a TB patient. Um, the notes that you all took on everything. The fact that you're keeping the public health, uh, keeping the public safe is just so amazing. A lot of times I felt like it was no longer about my care. I was feeling good. I was feeling healthy, but it was more about keeping friends and family safe. And I have this increased appreciation of all of you guys because I know you're doing that right now with COVID. And I know that you're treating a bunch of other TB patients so I don't get this again so that my small child doesn't get this. Um, and so I'm so grateful to all of you for the care that you do provide um, and hope that out of this talk, you guys just have a little bit of insight into what it feels like uh, mentally for patients who go through this. Thank you.